underground and overground. Well, Charles Hendry, this was in your hands when you were a minister. Indeed, and it's an issue which I've campaigned about consistently. So I tried to amend Labour's Energy Act in 2010 to require more gas storage. I tried to amend the Coalition's Infrastructure Act in 2015, with Tom supporting me, uh, for, to require more gas storage. And we've had a number of very close runs in the winter on our gas supplies. We had the Langerled pipeline from Norway freezing up one year. We had a, a winter which ran on well into April, almost into May. We've seen the threat by the Iranians to blockade the Straits of Hormuz, which would stop all Qatari gas coming through. We've seen previous disputes between Russia and Ukraine. And my view is you cannot rely on luck. And that in a number of years, we have been so close, one year within hours of running out of gas. And that therefore we should have been taking long-term strategic decisions to require more gas storage to be built. There's a, the point which was made there, which was our main gas storage facility was closed down by Centrica in 2017, I think. Uh, and that was a commercial decision, but the government could have stopped it. Greg Clark, the Secretary of State, could have said, no, we will step in. My view is you actually... To be fair, it wasn't a whimsical decision, was it? Was it? Centrica basically said, look, it's going to cost a fortune Absolutely. to keep this storage which is a like, you know, vast tank under the North Sea, to keep this in, uh, in shape so it doesn't blow up. And uh, we're moving away from fossil fuels. Why would we want to keep this vast storage facility when actually we don't want to store this stuff anyway? Well, because we all know we need gas as a transition fuel. Even though we're investing in renewables, we're still going to need gas. And therefore, if we're going to do that in a secure way, we've got to have more, more gas storage. We're going to move on. This is the great debate. After the break, what does the future look like for our energy supply? Did we make a bet on going green that might not pay off? It is important that we use all available sources of fuel within this country. We have 50 years worth of UK gas supply sitting under the north of England. We must phase out fossil fuels. Full stop. Welcome back to The Great Debate, where we're discussing the energy crisis and asking, can we keep the lights on this winter? Well, we know there's a lot of potential in renewable energy, but the wind doesn't always blow and the sun won't shine every day. It's clear that a move to renewables will increase our energy security, but can that transition be done without relying on oil and gas? Let's talk to Stephen Fairley in... Bathgate in Scotland. Good evening, Stephen. What's your view on this? Well, the question I was wanting to put to the panel was, is, is it the right time to increase the use of fossil fuels and fracking when we should be looking to a greener future? All right. Stephen's question for the panel uh, is, is it the right time to increase the use of fossil fuels? Tom Greatrex. No. I think what we should be doing is everything we can to reduce the amount of fossil fuels. Half of our electricity currently comes from fossil fuels. We can see the impact that has in terms of prices at the moment. If we'd built more low carbon capacity earlier, we wouldn't be facing quite as extreme situations as we are now. So, you know, if a nuclear power station like Hinkley had been built earlier, with operating now, that would save the equivalent of more than three billion pounds to the consumer just in one year. So it shows you the fact that energy instability and dirty energy uh, and insecure energy are all solved by doing the same thing, which is reducing the amount of fossil fuels we're using to burn for electricity and increasing the amount of different low-carbon sources to get the mix that gives us a secure and reliable supply. Catherine, um, I think you refer, you spoke about transition earlier on. Um, how, do you, how would you respond to Stephen's question? Well, I mean, I actually unfortunately disagree with Tom. I think that we reached a position in our energy transition where our energy security is at risk. And I think what people forget is that energy insecurity costs lives. And when energy is too expensive, that also costs lives. So it's not just climate change that costs lives. And the reason that we talked about the energy trilemma was that was we were recognising those things. And in recent years, we've forgotten. We forgot that we need to maintain energy security. So if you have blackouts in the winter, traffic lights and street lights go off, people's lives are at risk immediately. People who have medical equipment in their homes that need electricity, their, their lives are put at risk. When people can't afford to heat their homes, their lives are put at risk. So we have to have a balance of all these things. 
and we do not have the capability right now to manage the intermittency of wind. And the only way that we can fill that in the short term is through fossil fuels. So talking about building more wind turbines, it doesn't help you if it's not windy. Those extra wind turbines will all just sit there, not doing anything. Charles Entry. I think I can find a compromise between these two, which is that in the short term, we may well need to use more gas as backup as we go through the transition. Then we have to move even more quickly in a low carbon direction. We've got small modular reactors, very exciting nuclear technologies coming through. We've got hydrogen. I think we should be using tidal. We should be doing much more on energy efficiency. There's a whole range of areas where the future, I think, looks very green and very exciting. But we've got to get through this current crisis and then we need to have gas as part of that. Um, I don't think fracking is the answer. The UK government has said it's where uh, communities want it. There isn't going to be a single one which wants it. But I think that we do need to be um, making sure that we can then accelerate it more quickly. Liam, do you think Charles's uh, programme is the way through? I think um, from, from what I understand, we have enough oil and gas to get us through the next eight years. Um, it's a completely immoral situation for a government to be preparing licensing for over 130 new oil and gas projects, which it is what it's currently doing. And that's why Insulate Britain is supporting the Just Stop Oil Coalition, who are out in London at the moment in civil resistance against the criminal government, who are out to destroy the very fabric of our society. It's, it's treason, yeah. Well, They're okay. committing treason upon the people of this country. Uh, I think there's some there's some reaction to that, but let's just go find, if I may, to Jackie Skip uh, on the discussion as a whole. Jackie, Hi, you rugby, what's your thought? I just don't think we can ever abandon net zero, um, and I think we're regularly watching the horrors that climate change wreaks on us, really, and this just massively outweighs any problems we're facing now. Okay, Jackie, you have given us a real hard choice here, and I'm going to put this hard choice to our viewers' panel. Even if it means, for example, uh, these rolling blackouts, even if it means that we're going to have to pay more for boilers and so on, the things we've been discussing tonight, I would like those who think that in spite of all of that, we must still stick to the net zero by 2050 target. Those who still think that that target is both desirable and achievable, and we should stick to it. I am seeing those who want, sorry, your hands up. Okay, and those, uh, you can put your hands down, and those who think that actually that may not any longer be an absolute 100% priority that we need to stick to. Those who think net zero, in the face of what, we've, uh, what we're looking at, may have to be put back. Okay, I think there's still a majority for sticking with net zero. Thank you. And that is all we have time for this evening. It just remains for me to say thank you to our panellists here in the studio. Tom Greatrex, Charles Hendry, Liam Norton and Catherine Porter. Of course, as always, it's you at home who remain at the centre of our conversation, and if you'd like to be part of the programme next time, you can get in touch by emailing thegreatdebate at sky.uk. And for now, I want to thank you, our viewers panel, for your thoughtful, spirited contributions. Yeah. And also to thank all of you for watching uh, at home, keep talking, and we'll see you again at the same time next week for The Great Debate.